Welcome back to Bible study, to the study of the book of Genesis. Let us pray and we are good to start. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge your presence this morning with us and within us through the Holy Spirit. And we pray that his guidance will help us see Jesus Christ even better. Because in his name we prayed, amen. Letter to heaven or staircase to heaven. Our focus this morning is in Genesis 28. Nevertheless, we will have to start somewhat earlier to catch up, to pick up the story so we can uh, see where it's going. Jacob is the younger son. But because God reveals that to Rebekah even before the twins are born, he is to be treated as if he were the elder, the older son. There is a chain of events in the life of Isaac and Rebekah that involve the two twins, Jacob and Esau. And in the end, we see Jacob fleeing. He has to run for his life. But before that, we get to know some very interesting things about him. For instance, in chapter 25, Verse 27 says, So the boys grew, and these are the twins, of course. The boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. Jacob was a mild man. A soft man. Some translations say a wholesome man. It gives you the impression, hey, this guy, instead of being agitated and running after the rabbits of life, he's more relaxed, more laid back. He feels good sitting home or going out and shepherding the flock. He is all right. He has a good temperament, you may say. Then in chapter 26, we find out something else. Chapter 26, verse 34. When Esau was 40 years old, he took as wives Judith, the daughter of Barry the Hittite, and Basemat, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. You may think, why is this important? When Esau was 40, how old was his twin brother? Yes, same age, 40. So Esau gets married at 40, we would say kind of late in our context, but remember, they lived much longer in those days. So, I wouldn't say it was too late. Isaac, his father, married at the same age, and the twins came when Isaac was, what, 60. So, when Isaac was 60, that's when 
Esau and Jacob were born. Then when uh, Esau gets married at 40, Isaac is 100. Excellent. We are doing some math here. I don't want to go too far with math. On one of the pages, you have a timeline of uh, the major events in the life of Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph. If you're interested to see all those moments, points in time, it is worth studying it. I know it can be somewhat boring to some people, so I just want to rectify something that we said last week. Last week, we suggested that since here, when Jacob gets back, because Jacob runs away, so in 28, he runs away, then at one point he turns back, and when he gets back to see his father, we get the impression his father is what? 180, and he dies. So if Isaac is uh, 180, and uh, Jacob stays for 20 years with Laban, then our calculation would be that when Isaac blesses Jacob and Jacob runs away, his age is what? Hmm? 160. Correct? Yes, in theory. In reality, however, it seems that that is not the correct calculation. Because it seems that after Jacob gets back to Isaac, to his father, Isaac keeps on living for quite some time. Yes. So it means that he was younger than 180 when Jacob got back to him. How do I know? Well, if you put all the data together, you will come to the conclusion that when Jacob ran away, he was about 70 years old. Add 20 to 70, you get 90. If Isaac was 60 when Jacob was born, then 60 plus 90, he is what? 150. So he lives an extra 30 years, it seems. Why is that important? To know that sometimes the calculations of somebody that thinks he or she may be ready to die can be somehow flipped around by God's calculation. Because when Jacob ran away from Isaac, well, from Esau, blessed by Isaac, we get the impression Isaac does the blessing because he's ready to die. But then we find out that he actually dies 50 years later than he thought he was going to die. But back to Jacob. So the age, roughly, because there are some pieces of data that cannot be pinpointed, but roughly 70 years old guy leaves home, goes to his family to Haran, does that change a little bit the picture you had about Jacob? The 20 plus year old guy you thought he was running away and then at the well he finds a beautiful young girl and gets married. Hey, this is not a very young guy. Now, again, for that lifespan, he's not too old either because you can double 70 and you only get 140. And if he lives longer, 
like his father or his grandfather, then you have still plenty of time ahead of him. And don't forget Abraham at a certain age, 100 plus, way above 100 plus, got married or remarried. So I'm sharing these numbers in order to get a feeling of how different those calculations may be to our calculations. Because we calculate with a lifespan of 70, 80, 90, maybe 100. Okay, Jacob, 70 years old, is uh, running. Now, Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. You have the chiasm on your worksheet, on the first worksheet. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. We don't know how long the whole journey took. What we know, the distance was huge. Approximately 500 miles from south toward north. So that is days, weeks, months, who knows how long to get there. And uh, one night, he's tired, the sun had set, and he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head. So he makes the stone into a pillow. And he lay down in that place to sleep very normal and natural for somebody that is going somewhere and has nobody to stay at on the way. No hotel, no motel, no special places to get a good night rest. The best pillow you can get is a stone. 70 years old guy. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it at his head and he lay down in that place and sleep, to sleep. Then he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven. And here the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it. Some translations say beside him or over him. I'm trying to show you why translations differ. Say this is the letter. Okay. And here you have Jacob. Okay. So he dreams. Here there are angels. Ascending and descending. And one translation says that the Lord, which is Yahweh. So the word in the Hebrew text is Yahweh. Is up here. The other translation says that Yahweh is here. See, pretty much the same position, only that here Jacob can see Yahweh at the top of the ladder or at the top of it, above it, meaning the ladder, or above him or beside him, which is right here. I believe this should be preferred because of the way Yahweh addresses him. And said, so the Lord stood over him or above him and told him. So the Lord speaks to Jacob and said, it's a vow actually coming from God to Jacob. I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Please notice the identification that Yahweh does to Jacob. I am the Lord of 
Abraham, your father, and of Isaac. We had a discussion last time about what the meaning of that can be. Well, for a guy that may have not had this kind of encounter with God up to this point, identification for God to tell him exactly, precisely who he is, is important. So Yahweh tells him, I am the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, your father. Also, your descendants shall be at the dust, as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Have you seen that before? Of course, this is a reiteration of the Abrahamic blessing from chapter 12, verse 3, where God tells Abraham, in you all the families of the world, of the earth, will be blessed. Behold, I am with you. See, that's why I'm saying that Yahweh is speaking directly to him. Because Yahweh tells him, behold, I am with you. So, Yahweh and Jacob are together here. And will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. Three very important aspects here. God is with him there. God is going to be with him where he goes. And God is going to bring him back. Isn't that wonderful? What an assurance of God's presence for him. God comes to Jacob and tells him, hey, I'm here with you. You think you're alone? You're thinking uh, you don't matter? Nobody cares about you? You may be thinking that uh, a wild animal can come and devour you? Don't worry. I'm here with you. I'll be going with you. And I'll bring you back. And this movement in the Bible you can find in different places. For instance, when God allows Babylon to come and take Israel captive. Same kind of movement. God tells them, hey, I am with you. I'm going with you into exile. And I'm bringing you back here. And then it says... For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. God keeps his promise. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid, he was afraid, and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. That word that is translated with awesome can also be translated with fearful or dreadful. So in the Bible, when you have a strong emotion that you see as awful or awesome, or dreadful, or fearful. In the Old Testament, all those concepts can be in one single word. Depending on the quality of that feeling, it can be positive or negative. Let me ask you this sense of awe in Jacob's case. In Jacob's case, is it positive or negative? It's a positive impression. It's a, <gasps> wow. But that realization of the awesomeness of God almost comes across as a <gasps> terrifying or fearful experience. Wow. This is incredible. So he says, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God or Beth El, Beth El, the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning, and this is 
the highlight or the focal point of the chiasm, Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. So that's where the whole chiasm, this little chiasm here, points, where the pillow becomes a pillar. He pours oil on it, and that's a place of remembrance for him. And he called the name of that place Bethel, or house of God, Beth house, El, God. But the name of that city had been loose previously. Then Jacob made a vow. Please notice what he says in the vow. Most translations have it this way. If God will be with me, and keep me this way that I'm going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace. So in most translations, you have if, as if Jacob is saying, if, okay, you spoke to me, you told me you are with me, you are going with me, you are bringing me back. If this is true, then this is what I will do in response. The Hebrew text, however, and you will find translations that highlight this, suggests that the correct translation is instead of if, to say because. So God comes and speaks to him and tells him, hey, I'm going to be with you, or I am with you, I'm going with you, I'm bringing you back. God reiterates the blessings he gave to his father Abraham. God identifies himself as being the God of Abraham, his father, and of Isaac. And when Jacob realizes what is going on here, he says, wow, this is awesome. This is incredible. And he starts speaking back to God and gives God a vow but instead of saying if, as if negotiating with God, okay, if you do this, then I will do this, he rather says, because you will do this, because you are with me, because you will come with me, because you will bring me back, because of those things, the Lord shall be my God, and this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will surely give you a tenth. Jacob promises to give God a tenth as a result or as a reaction to what God promises to him. So because you do this and this and this to me, because you will be the Lord, my God, then this is what I am going to do as a response. Please look at the focus of the blessing. I have a smaller chiasm down there where God pronounces the blessing. The focus of that chiasm has the promise on one side, the remembrance of the promise on the other side, and then in the middle you have, Behold, I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. So the focal point is, I will bring you back to this land. Please look at Genesis 26, verse 3, because it is the same thing that God tells Isaac. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you, for to you and your descendants I'll give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. So the continuity is obvious it's Abraham, Isaac, then Jacob. 
Now the question is, after we've seen this encounter that Jacob is having with Yahweh, has Jacob fulfilled his promise, his vow? In Genesis chapter 33, 18 to 20, let me read this passage. Now he's coming back, right? Back to Canaan, 33, 18 to 20. Then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram, and he pitched his tent before the city, and he bought the parcel of land where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. Then he erected an altar there and called it El Elohe Israel, which means El, that is God, is the God of Israel. So had Yahweh become his God? Of course. So he keeps the vow, yes, Yahweh will be my God, and he calls that place El Elohe Israel. Then look in 35, chapter 35, verses 6, 7, and then 14 and 15. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan, and he and all the people who were with him, and he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Again, El Bethel. So when he comes back to Bethel, because he left from here, he went all the way up to Haran. When he comes back, he has that moment of El Bethel. Something else, verses 14 and 15. So Jacob set a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it, and Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel. So again, here, where he comes back, he remembers the promise he made when he had left. Genesis 31, 13 is another moment, 31, 13. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your family. This is happening right here, El. So what God is doing to Jacob is this. When he has this moment of theophany, of God appearing to him, God promises, I will be your God, your El. Then when Jacob is here, God comes to him and tells him, hey, I am that God, the God that spoke to you here. Then later on, when he comes all the way down here, he remembers and he speaks about El. And then he comes further down and God specifically speaks to him and tells him, go to Beth El and do what you've said or you had said you were going to do. So again, L here. What I'm trying to suggest is that throughout this journey, L is always there for Jacob. He pops up again and again and again. But I have a question. Did he keep his promise with regard to tithing? Because he said, from everything you're giving me, I will give you a 
tithe, did he keep his promise? We don't know. There is something, however, very interesting in the text, which seems to be part of the structure of this section. Here you have angels appearing to Jacob. Over here you have again angels appearing to Jacob. Right here, after the angels appear to Jacob, Jacob does something. He prepares a gift, a huge gift, actually, a very valuable package that at first glance seems to be an attempt of bribing his brother Esau. There are, however, Bible scholars that believe that Jacob did that huge gift that he was going to give to his brother as a tithe given to God. Based on the same model that we have earlier with Abraham and Melchizedek, or Melchizedek, Abraham and Melchizedek. We don't know too much about Melchizedek. Of course, he was a priest of the Most High, the text says. So in that case, you kind of have a certainty that Abraham gave tithe to God through his priest, Melchizedek. Does Jacob see his brother, his older brother, as a priest in this context? You know that biblically the elder brother is the priest of the house when the father is passed. Maybe Jacob doesn't know that his father is still alive. And now he tries to recognize in Esau the priest of his family. Maybe at this moment uh, Jacob uh, thinks, uh, okay, let me now straighten things out and recognize his right value. At the level of language, you know that whenever he sends emissaries or messengers to his brother, this is the, the language, your servant to my Lord. So he recognizes Esau as being his Lord, and he is the servant. I'm just asking these questions. I don't know the answer to this. But in the text, some see elements, and I have noticed some myself, I'm not certain though, that that big gift that Jacob sends to Esau is actually a fulfillment of his promise that of everything he receives, he will give God a tithe. One interesting thing in the way he relates to Esau, he, Jacob, says to Esau, I've looked at you as to the face of God. Whatever that language means. John chapter 1 verse 51 says, And he said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So Jesus makes a sort of application that has to do with this moment of Jacob's life, where angels are walking up and down on the staircase. He says, you will see angels walking up and down, and here is the Son of Man. They will actually be going up and down upon 
the Son of Man. So the angels of God resting and then going back from the Son of Man. I think that is a very interesting picture in the New Testament that kind of gives us the sense of what happened here, actually. If you move Jacob closer to the base of this letter here, because here I have Jacob, move him closer here, and Yahweh is right there, it's practically the same scenario. Right? The angels are ascending and descending, and Jacob is right there with Yahweh right above him. So it's like Jacob can enjoy the presence of God, of Yahweh, and of his angels. And you will see that throughout his journey, there are angels. Angels appear here. And Ellen White suggests that angels even appear to Esau and told Esau, watch out. Don't touch him. I'm still looking to see in the text where she is getting that information from. I suppose it is in the text somewhere. Questions? Thank you. The question is, what nations today are descendants of Esau? Esau or Edom, the Edomites, are those that later in the Bible are mentioned to be living in the Mount of Seir, S-E-I-R. If you want a location today, have you ever visited Petra? So it's that area. So that's the geographic area where the Edomites, meaning the descendants of Edom or Esau, um, used to live. Now, who they are today, I believe just like in the case of um, every nation, every tribe, it's very hard to locate and give the exact perimeter of where they are because uh, ever since, marriage has diluted, so to speak, the, the Edomite blood even there. But most likely in that area, even today, there is still presence of the identity that ties people to Esau, to Edom. Okay. So the question is, why is it that the biblical way of identifying Yahweh later on is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, instead of saying, for instance, Abraham, Jacob, and Joseph? Because if you read the story of Isaac, although Isaac lives a long life, longer than Abraham, he dies at 180, and uh, he dies in Genesis chapter 35, yes. So the question is, why God focuses on Isaac as well when you look at his life and you see little really happening in his life? There's a lot about Abraham, a lot about Jacob, then you will have a lot happening about uh, Joseph and God intervening in his life. We don't know too much about Isaac's life other than God answering his prayer because he prays for Rebekah to become uh, fertile because for a while Rebekah, just like Sarah, was beautiful and barren. So Isaac prays and God listens to his prayer and uh, blesses Rebecca with children. And outside of that moment when he lies about who his wife is, saying she is my sister, we don't see too much interaction between God and Isaac. We are not saying it did not happen. 
but we don't have too much in the text. So the question I think is uh, valid. Why not using Joseph as a point of reference instead of Isaac? The best answer I can gather beyond the answer I don't know is uh, that uh, you have one, two, three. You have three witnesses right at the beginning. In Jewish mind, the two or three witnesses are important. For instance, when God identifi identifies himself to Jacob, he speaks about Abraham and uh, Isaac. He has two witnesses. When um, he spoke to Isaac, he only had one witness, Abraham, because that's what he was, the first in the line. But then you have uh, Jacob added to the one, two, three, and then it stops. You don't have the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and the God of Joseph. With three, it kind of stops. I suspect it is because, okay, so now you have three of the first, so the three first ancestors of the nation that had God or Yahweh as their God, and that should suffice for you as a proof that I am indeed their God, because you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the best answer I have. So the observation is that Joseph is not in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And obviously he is not because the lineage of Jesus Christ goes via Judah. Right? So you have uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah. That's the fourth. With all that, Joseph receives a huge space in the book of Genesis. Right? The description of Joseph's life and uh, how God intervenes for him and uh, how God teaches lessons to the whole tribe. I think those are amazing stories, and Joseph is a type of Jesus. Obviously, because just like Joseph is sold, Jesus is sold. Just like Joseph rescues his brothers from famine, Jesus rescues his brothers from famine, from spiritual famine, if you want so. So, Joseph is important, but it's not, he's not in the lineage. But then the same can be said about Judah, because Judah doesn't become a point of reference either. And uh, if you look at the life of Judah, you may even question how much Yahweh was his God. I believe he was, because although we have a very weird story of Judah and Tamar. We'll see that later on. Later, after that story, Judah seems to be the protector of Benjamin. So he seems to have a turnaround in his life, a turning point where he comes to his senses and uh, changes. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great observation. There is something happening around the concept of the land in the book of Genesis. That's um, unquestionable. And if you take the story of the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in the life of each one of them, the land plays a very important role. But how? To Abraham, God promises the land. God even moves Abraham from Mesopotamia to Canaan. Promises him the land, but also tells him he will not get the land. Because 400 years have to pass, and only his descendants will get the land. And we know from history later on that the people of Israel goes down to Egypt, and then they come back and inherit the land that God had given to Abraham. The reason why God doesn't give Abraham the land right away, 
he says that the iniquity of those people has not reached its fullness. So that's the story of Abraham. Abraham never claims possession of the land. Even when he has to bury his wife, Sarah, he buys a piece of land and a burial place instead of uh, accepting a donation which was offered to him. Then Isaac, if you look at Genesis 26, you will see that God blesses Isaac immensely. At one point, I think the text says that he was blessed a hundredfold. He's blessed to the point where everybody around him becomes jealous. They feel uh, that uh, now Isaac is becoming uh, the lord of the place. There are all kind of uh, struggles with regard to the wells. Abraham had that story as well. But in the case of uh, Isaac, the people of the place in uh, Gerar, they fill up the wells that Abraham had uh, dug, and uh, there are all kind of uh, difficult struggles between the shepherds of one and the other, but he is blessed immensely. If you read the text, you get the impression he only rents the place to do agriculture. He never owns those territories. He does agriculture on a land that although is his, it's not his. It's going somewhere. So watch. Jacob. Jacob receives the promise just like Abraham and Isaac. Abraham in chapter 12 Isaac in chapter 26, Jacob receives the same promise that the land is his. And yet, even after he goes to Haran and then comes back, when he goes to Beth El, he buys a piece of land that he can use as a point of reference of his journey. He doesn't claim it. So again, he has the land, but he does not have the land. But isn't that our journey? Because in Hebrews chapter 11, later on, we get an application where the apostle says that all these have never received the promise. Because they were looking at something else, something much bigger, to the city whose builder is God, the city of uh, strong foundations, whose builder is God himself. So, in other words, there is this journey of the land being given, but not being received as a possession yet. Already, but not yet. And we have the same experience where we already, says the Apostle Paul, we are citizens of heaven, of the new Jerusalem, but we are not there yet. So we have it, but it's not ours yet. I believe that's the typology behind all these uh, possession, land possession promises, but unfulfilled promises, at least to a certain point, because then when uh, the people of Israel comes back from Egypt, the 400 uh, years being passed, they will possess that land. And that is a critical moment in the history of uh, the nation. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a good uh, insight. So, Jacob promises to give God a tithe out of everything God blesses him with. But then it seems that even if we take the gift that he sent to Esau as a fulfillment of his promise regarding tithing, he waited for 20 years until he started doing what he promised to do. Good observation. I would 
go even further with a question. And as this, how did Jacob even know about the concept of tithing? We know Abraham knew about it. We have nothing mentioned with regard to Isaac. We don't know if Isaac practiced tithing or not. We don't know if Abraham practiced tithing as a rule throughout his life or not, or it was that moment. We don't know about Jacob either, whether while he was away in uh, Haran, he did anything to fulfill that promise. But I think what we are seeing here with Abraham and then with Jacob is a sort of uh, launching or springboard toward a greater reality that will be specified later on in the Mosaic laws, which were laws given by God, obviously, to clarify what tithing really means and who should be using uh, the tithe and how somebody gives God that tithe. So here we have bits and pieces, very scattered in the story. But to me, it is amazing that the concept of tithing, please notice this, the concept of tithing, when it starts in the Bible, does not start with ruling or with commending tithing. It starts with some people responding to God's blessings out of their sense of gratefulness, of uh, gratitude. It's not that God comes to Abraham and tells him, Abraham, out of this um, war or battle, pray, give me a tithe, give it to Melchizedek. No, the story doesn't say that. And it's not that God comes to Jacob and tells him, listen, I'm going to bless you, but make sure you will give me a tithe of everything I will bless you with. What I see in both situations is a reaction, a natural reaction of gratitude, of thankfulness on the side of these two people at what God has done in their lives. And to me that is great because I believe that's the essence of uh, tithing. Tithing is an answer of gratitude, of thankfulness toward God based on His blessings. God has given, I cannot tithe, I cannot give Him a tithe unless He blesses me and I have, out of what He gives me, I can count the one tenth to give Him back. So tithing, based on the text of the Bible up to this point, is an answer of love, of allegiance to God, and um, a moment of exaltation almost when I recognize God's blessings in my life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. There are deep insights and uh, some difficult questions that we may be able or not to answer, but in everything we see you showing up in wonderful ways to people of uh, different temperaments and characters, people in need of you, and we see people answering in gratitude to your goodness. We pray that we will do the same in Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit. Amen.